Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à l'Université Concordia. My name is Rebecca Duclos and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts here at the University. It's so nice to see such a great turnout for this year's Marianne Beckett-Baxter Memorial Lecture. Thank you to the Beckett-Baxter family, to Concordia's Thinking Out Loud organizers, and to Concordia University Alumni Association. For the uninitiated, Thinking Out Loud is a series of stimulating co conversation on topics that matter. It's about connecting Concordia research to the public. It's about creating discourse that goes beyond sound bites or cliches. And it's our opportunity to welcome colleagues, collaborators, and friends to a new community of listeners. Today, we are staging a conversation between two extraordinary practitioners to hear about process, about preparation, about practice, poetry, and performance creation. So let me begin by welcoming Concordia contemporary dance professor, Sylvie Penet-Raymond. And also today's very special guest, playwright, actor, and director, Robert Lepage. Can you hear us very clearly? <clears throat> Good. I hope so. They changed my battery three times <laughs> waiting in the wings. Yeah, we use a lot of energy. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I have to uh, sort of start right away to, uh, thanking Robert Lepage for first having accepted to do this in his really busy schedule and also um, for doing it graciously. And uh, so I totally appreciate your gesture in making yourself available to all of us here. I'll just dive right in. Um, the name of your company is Ex Machina. You drop the Deus yeah. out of Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm the Deus. I guess. <laughs> be. Yes. So we're not going to have anything flying down today no, with a no, cable no, no. and trying to uh, arrange the fate of, uh, of things and get us out of dilemmas. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to sort of uh, jump right in because I know that um, You've come up through the conservatoire, you've, come, you've done theater, uh, you went to overseas to train, and then at a certain point you decided, this is what I want to do. Um, and I, I remember seeing a cl clip in 19, I think it was early 80s of you doing an improv all on your own, uh, a nine minute improv on New York City the elusive New York City, and you played all the different characters. And at that point, it became like a turning point in terms of looking at how we could perform. Um, there was a before Robert Lepage and then after Robert Lepage in the Ligue Nationale d'Improvisation. And yes, <laughs> you were already making your mark back you then. Say so. <laughs> But it's a great, it's, it, it's a great uh, uh, piece of video. And I just wanted to, uh, I think for me this was kind of very emblematic of the kind of ability to multiply yourself in many roles and situations and to bring things alive. And at that point when you did that nine mm -hmm. minute improv, you had no props at all. Mm -hmm. It was simply you and now you're working with incredible means and resources and collaborators. I'm curious about this arc and what has remained and what has changed dramatically since mm -hmm. those early years. Do you want to sort of address that? Well, the thing is that my, uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd say when I was in the conservatory, uh, I was in the conservatory in the late 70s, early 80s, so uh, it was in the years where uh, teach, most of the teachers at the Conservatoire in Quebec City, not the Conservatoire here in Montreal, the Conservatoire in Montreal was still very obsessed by uh, voice work and, and because there's an industry in Montreal of you know voice mm -hmm. and traditional text, acting, and, and all of that, so in television, et cetera, et cetera. But in Quebec City, the only industry for an actor is theater. <clears throat> so a lot of the, the uh, uh, I'd say that the, the, the teachers were more obsessed by physical theater, uh, by any kind of new uh, theatrical vocabulary that came from Europe at that time, very influenced by stuff that came from Asia also. So we weren't very uh, savvy 
uh, with the great classics when I was in the conservatory. I mean, of course, we, we would study them once in a while, but it wasn't the, the, the basics. Um, we were taught to move, to shut up, uh, to, you know, some teachers had uh, done workshops with Grotowski. Mm -hmm. uh, some people were more Brechtian, some people had studied at Lecoq. So, so I was kind of, a, I, I wanted to, I was 17 and I was hoping I, I'd have a part in a soap opera. That was my thing. <laughs> and I went to conservatoire and I went, well, what are we doing here? It's so weird. It's so, what is it? And I discovered this whole, you know, this wealth of, of, of uh, theatrical vocabularies and, and you know stuff I never dreamed I'd, I'd be able to do or be interested in and, and uh, so there was a lot of playing around with mm -hmm. stuff there was a lot of poetry mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a lot of uh, text was used almost as music in some of the classes uh, it wasn't the first thing so, mm -hmm. so it completely changed my perspective on what it was and it was in the good old days of, of political theater so when you came out of school, you, you didn't audition for a French CBC or you didn't audition for that. You, you'd go and defend the unions and you'd create mm -hmm. these, you know, these political shows and we'd work with masks and mime and pantomime and commedia dell'arte and we'd mm -hmm. use all of those uh, mm -hmm. techniques we had learned at school. So uh, we were very, very creative that way and, and, uh, and very political, very politicized mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that kind of all went out the window <laughs> at one point, I guess, uh, in the early 80s. And people started to be interested in a completely different way. And maybe because also Quebec uh, opened up mm -hmm. a bit more to the world. So you had people like Gilles Maheu from Carbon 14, you had Michel Lemieux, uh, uh, Edouard Locke, uh, Marie Chouinard, uh, tons, tons of great artists, whether they were in theater or, mm -hmm. or in performance art or, or in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in dance, who, who would go to New York, go to London, go to Paris, uh, would check out what was going on there and would come back with this kind of new avant-garde uh, yeah. approach and, and this interest in new media, mm -hmm. which was very, very appealing at the time. And uh, I started to be interested in that. And it was a kind of a natural segue from working with mask and mime and all of that to move into uh, another form of expression that wasn't, once again, text-based. Text -based. Yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, using whatever tool you had mm -hmm. at that time. Of course, there were no computers, no cell phones, no nothing. But still, there were a few gadgets <laughs> that you could use. And, and uh, so I'd play around with that. And my theater was pretty much, was very playful mm -hmm. at that time. And, and it was like, an, as I say, a natural segue from, from uh, the years of mime to the years of media. So, I mean, the notion of play and the notion of being resourceful, uh, now you find yourself uh, with a, a humongous um, kind of place to create and imagine and and you're also looking forward to building a new place. Mm -hmm. um, well, humongous is a humongous word. Well, <laughs> humong humongous. Humongous, let's it's say humongous big, in terms big, yeah, of, it's of its thing, potential yeah. and, and the, yeah, yeah, the resources. No, it, it, yeah, of course, the, the, the structure, Ex Machina is, pre is a pretty big structure now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, on all levels, and, and uh, I feel very privileged and very spoiled. But of course, I've, I've worked my yes. butt off to yeah, get there, did. and <laughs> I think that I'm not going to uh, uh, say that I was uh, I wasn't privileged in the sense that people did not <clears throat> fund me or help me uh, just because I was Robert Lepage or something. I mean, we, a lot of uh, we just came out of a 10-year uh, uh, period Drought. of stagnation yes. called Harper. And, uh, and it's called the desert. And hopefully, I never thought I'd get to say, to say that you know, the yes, well, liberal you... government is actually a, <laughs> a, a breath of fresh air. But anyways, but it is. I mean, what can I say? There's a lot of there's a lot of promises there, and a lot of things. And it sounds like it's well, things are going to happen. But still, for these ten years, mm -hmm. it's it's been very very tough. So we've ex machina continued to to grow. Uh, in, in, you know, in a big way because we had so many allies from the time before these, these 10 years uh, around the world to, mm -hmm. to be able to fund and co-produce and, and uh, distribute or, or, or present our work mm -hmm. abroad. Uh, so we survived that, that, that but it, it, it was tricky. You had to be inventive and you had to uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, take a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that, uh, because I, I know a lot of my colleagues said, oh, ask him this, ask him that. Um, so I'm going to ask right away one of the questions. Um, so it, um, with all the resources that you have, um, if you were to uh, work now with something and you had and decided not to work with any resources mm -hmm. like you have right now, what kind of thing would you be able to envision? I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, we, everyone has access now to some resources, uh -huh. you know, even the smallest means. But yeah. if you were to sort of scale down now, yeah. would you see yourself, what would you see yourself doing? I, I don't know, I guess I'd have to try, but if I was wanting to do a Robert Lepage unplug, you know. <laughs> okay, let's and, the and I'm off. slowly getting there. I mean, uh, uh, I've, I've worked on a couple of projects recently where there's no video and there's no new technologies and there's no. You know, the thing is that I always feel a bit obligated to use these things because my company is called Xmac, you know, because of that, because we're also um, inviting these things in to explore and to see if there's theater there or if there's a storytelling tools in these new mm -hmm. things, but so I always feel a bit kind of obligated, but um, maybe less and less, and, and, and mm -hmm. so I do opera work now where there's absolutely none of these things, mm -hmm. um, where I, I, <coughs> I resort to, to old uh, Vietnamese water puppet techniques and things like that. I'm very interested in, in that and, and find that, you know, actually um, what we call technology is, is uh, you know, a pencil is, is technology, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it depends how you use it and mm -hmm. what you do with it. But um, I'm, I'm kind of scaling down in the sense that I, I, I don't rely in, on these things as much as I did. I mean, the show we're doing right now at the Usin C, we're doing uh, Quills, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the text of, of Doug Wright. And um, of course, yes, there's, there's theater craft there, but there, there's... Uh, there's no new media, there's no projections, there's no video, there's no uh, infrared detection, interactive, whatever, you know, there's none of that. It's, it's very, very uh, basic. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that, uh, uh, well, let's just, just dive right in then into Quill's, mm -hmm. the show, and I saw the, the show, and, and I was quite happy to see this work. Um, and I was speaking to uh, somebody who works in cinema right afterwards, and um, the person went, said there, there was, the, this play was written in the 90s during the, the Reagan uh, era with a lot of censorship. And, um, and, but it's set with Marquis de Sade, and maybe you can speak to that uh, also about, um, so it kind of combines a little bit of these two um, epochs or eras. And um, so this person in cinema was saying, well, you know, th there was a real 90s feel about the scenery, the staging. <laughs> And I said, oh gosh, you know, yeah. it was like the mirrors and everything like that. So yeah. I, it, it was, did it infiltrate into the process, the way these kinds of th well, things it, it, seep it in? Might, it might have, it's just there's nothing on stage in that show that has not been explored in other shows mm -hmm. before that we've, you know, uh, a lot of... The thing is that we work on so many projects at Ex Machina that there's always ideas that, you know, fall on the editing floor, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the editing room floor, and, and it's just there waiting to be reused or re-injected mm -hmm. or re-explored. So a lot of the stuff that we do have not been um, discovered on the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of stuff just kind of... So there's this whole idea that n n nothing's really invented and nothing's really lost. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of an Einstein quote. I don't know what it is in English. I said it sounds stupid. In French, it's rien ne se perd, rien ne se crie. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, so we, we don't feel, even if we've invested in, in, in a workshop on mm -hmm. a show to explore uh, this idea or that idea, uh, even if it's not used in the show, we know it's just going to, it's not going to stay uh, on a shelf and, and uh, accumulate dust. It's probably going to go into the ground and wait till it grows into something, into another project. So, but for that you have to do a lot of stuff and you have to have a, your, your fingers in many pies, you mm -hmm. know, uh, for that, that kind of thing to happen. So let's just go back to quills, mm -hmm. if, if we can, just to, because, uh, I mean, I'm tempted to go and follow this, this path about reusing things, because I see some connections between mm -hmm. some of the other works that you've done and from play to cinema. But I'd like to just go back to the play that's running right now, it is in, say, quills. Um, would you like to, uh, what, what made you choose this work? Well, it's another thing. I mean, I, I met up with this uh, this young actor in Quebec City, who, who's also uh, a director, and he, he does his own stuff and uh, does interesting work. And, and we were talking about maybe doing a project together. And, and I asked him, 
what would you want to do? And he, actually, he's going to have a show at the end of the season here, uh, that he's in Quebec City, but he's, it's going to be here at uh, Prospero. Um, he's doing train spotting. But what he does is that he, he's interested in taking films and seeing how they can be adapted to theater. And he said to me, I, I'd like to do, uh, I saw a great film called Quills, and I, a film I really liked a lot. And even though it was a big commercial flop, mm -hmm. it was still mm -hmm. a very interesting thing. And, and uh, I completely connected to that idea, and he said, well, I'd like to adapt it on stage and make it a play. And I asked for the rights, and I didn't get the rights. And I said, you know what, I suspect it was probably a play before, that's probably you didn't get the rights. And in fact, it, it was a play. We discovered it was this great play, play um, in the 90s uh, called Quills. It's much more hardcore mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. Yes. Um, you know, politically, thematically, sexually, and all that. Uh, then, and that the film actually was, um, in French we say, idulcoré. it was a kind of watered down yeah. in a certain way to, uh, to please Hollywood standards, I guess. And so, uh, so we discovered this thing and we went, whoa, this is really interesting. And, and he just said, well, would you want to do the Marquis de Sade? And I had this intuition that I'd, I'd have fun doing this and, and I said, okay, well, I'll do it, but of course it meant and also, we discovered that the play had never been translated in French. It's been translated in probably every language in the world for some reason. Nobody translated this great piece in French. So it was a great opportunity for us to kind of not rewrite it, because no. translation is translation, but translation is also betrayal, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and um, so, so we said, okay, why don't we, we do this? So we got the rights uh, from Doug Wright to, to translated. He even trusted us enough because he knew about my work. So he said, well, I trust that you can restructure it a bit mm -hmm. and bring your own thing to it. And, and, and I, there's this thing about uh, you, you can't just um, do experiments and try to find new pathways and new ways of writing and all that without going back mm -hmm. to the repertoire, you know. And I've never really done that. I've done that a lot in, in opera, but I've never done that in a play. And saying yes to this offer meant that I had to memorize lines, which I've probably never, I've never done this in my life. <laughs> I always improvise and the improvs are two hours long and they eventually kind of dry down to an hour. And then eventually, you know, all of the dead skin falls off and then there's something that I call the text, but that's very late in the process. Mm -hmm. It's like probably at the end of the tour that you get the, you know. <laughs> and that's, that's how I write. But I never, so I don't learn it. I just, you know. Fluff it. Fl fluff it and eventually it becomes, and people say, yeah. oh, that's a great piece of writing. I say, oh my yeah. God. So, and, but this meant actually, um, and also because the play, uh, the original play, even though it's written by an American writer, it's, um, uh, it's written because he tried to reproduce the way people spoke in England in the mm -hmm. end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th, and this whole kind of. A, so it's full of British wit and accents mm -hmm. and things like that. So we had to translate it into French, which was kind of odd because it had to be period French. And Marquis de Sade and the whole mm -hmm. French, it's French, so it was yeah, just kind of crying to be translated. So it had to be, you know, it's all convoluted and it's all full of lace and all that. And I went, my God, what am I putting myself through here? And, uh, but it was interesting. That process was more interesting than saying yes to a, a part that uh, somebody at TNM would have offered me to play a Molière. And, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, this was different. It meant inventing it in a certain way. There was place for me to invent what I was going to say, even though it's already written. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there was enough uh, latitude there, and and but the piece, even though it was the stories already written, um, was workshopped the same way we workshopped our, our usual creations. Mm -hmm. So, and would you like to talk about how you workshop your usual creations? Well, the thing is that, um, well, I won't go into detail on what we do exactly in the workshops because that would take forever. But uh, maybe to explain how we use time. Time is time is very important. How you how you use it. Uh, let's say. Uh, you get eight weeks to do a, a piece in, uh, I think Stratford is six weeks or something. Mm -hmm, six like weeks, yeah. Yeah, but anyways, uh, it's very short. But let's have TNM, you get eight weeks. So um, we rehearse about eight weeks, more or less, at Ex Machina. But at TNM or, or any other repertoire theater, you would rehearse it uh, eight weeks in a row, right? So you get eight weeks and that's it. 
um, we take the eight weeks and we spread them over two years. So it's exactly the same amount of time, but it feels like you've rehearsed a year mm -hmm. in those two years. And does this thing, uh, you know what a rendering farm is, right? Go ahead. Well, the rendering, rendering farm, farm, I mean, people who are into CGI and, and programming is that during the day you program and you do your computer graphics yeah. or whatever and all that, and then you go home and during the night there's this room yeah. called the rendering farm and all of the <laughs> computers go, yeah, but if this happens, what do I do? What you do? Whatever, whatever. <laughs> oh, have solution. Oh, take solution B. Yeah, but this, this whole thing happens. It take, takes 24 hours a week sometimes to render mm -hmm. a five minute clip or something like that. But this thing happens, so it's the subconscious mm -hmm. of what you've created. And I believe the same thing happens in, in, in uh, whether it's a, a collective creation uh, or if it's a, a piece like, like Quills mm -hmm. that's already written. So you, you, you do like a first week, you meet everybody, you read, uh, you, you do a bit of playing around and research and improv, whatever, then goodbye for four months and you forget about it. You don't even... And during these four months, there's something that goes on right. in the subconscious that connects a couple of dots, and you don't, you're not really conscious of it. Then you come back and you rehearse for two weeks. And then during these two weeks, people come back and they're informed by something that they don't really understand. And some people also do research, you know, it's not forbidden, you know, to <laughs> discuss, with you. it's not forbidden to bump into a production of quills and go, oh, what are, what are, oh, this is what this means, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so, so those eight weeks are spread out over about two years, and, and, and so you're actually rehearsing a year mm -hmm. uh, without noticing it. Well, this brings me to a and little... And it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is, I'm, I'm, this, um, uh, about attention is a limited resource. To achieve creativity in an existing domain, there must be a surplus of attention available. This comes from a, um, I'm going to try and pronounce his name, Csikszent uh, Mihaly, uh, Csikszent Mihaly, and who's uh, written about creativity and flow. And I think what you've just described right now is exactly what he speaks about, this ability to um, allow for uh, input and then insight, mm -hmm. and then to be able to sort of uh, work on it and to just take it to that other place. But the, the attention as resource, yeah. I, th I think, is a really interesting um, but I, I, th I think it also has to do with the, um, the fact that um, you have to have a lot of humility when you, you work on something. Uh, and what I mean by humility is that you are not the driving force mm -hmm. of what you are creating or writing, even though you're the director or you're the official writer or whatever. Uh, you're just a, the captain of the boat or you're, you're some kind of guy that goes like this and says the wind is going to go. But still, you're not, you're not uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the work is the, the important thing, it's the central right. thing. And that has its own life and has its own thing and you don't know anything about it when you start. And, and, I, and I really feel it when we work on a new, a new piece, let's say there's six people, collaborate, six collaborators who are around the table talking. And I really feel that underneath the table where we're sitting, there's all these roots that are all kind of connecting and touching and doing this whole thing going on. And it can only be this kind of stuff because it's that specific person who meets this specific person who meets et cetera, et cetera, and meets mm -hmm. me. And that there's this show and it exists and it's on the ground. And we don't have the vaguest idea what it looks like, what it's going to be about. We're just talking and resonating or whatever. And eventually we're, we're, we're like a bunch of uh, archeo archeologists, how do you say that? Archeologists. Archeolo archeologists. Archeologists. We're just kind of you know, we do improvs and exploration mm -hmm. stuff, and we're just kind of going, oh, there's a little piece of a bone here, okay? It's, it's probably, and somebody there is, has another piece of bone, go, oh, this is probably a spine there, okay? But we don't, we don't know yet, but there's a spine. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how it looks like, but it's a spine, okay? So this, this is where the spine. And then you do that, and you just trust that it's there. Mm -hmm. And right. eventually, it kind of reveals itself in the strangest positions, and it's just stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and you go, well, so you have to believe in, in that, that mm -hmm. it's there, mm -hmm. so and it's going to show itself. Absolutely, which we're talking about the, the creative process, and, and I, I totally relate to that. I mean, I teach creative process in, in contemporary dance, and, and I also teach choreography, so I do understand the, the need for something to, to, 
to sift and sit and to continue to be colliding with the outside world and other realities. And um, so maybe I'd just like to take you in now into our, our house. Um, um, one of the reasons why we were interested also in speaking with you is because one of the, you know you have this project of building a new building, mm -hmm. and we have a project of trying to get a new um, graduate program, an MFA in performance creation. You know we have to jump through a lot of hoops to get this one going. But I was just really curious to um, hear from your perspective what kind of education and training for somebody who's really wanting to go into um, interdisciplinary, intertwined, this kind of process we've been talking about. What kind of training and education, because it's, you know, education is one thing, training mm -hmm. is, is they're, they're mixed, but they're also come so many different sources. What do you see as being something? Well, I don't know exactly how the whole um, education system and, and training system works in either universities or colleges, but I know that there's this tendency in the West to be specialist about a specific thing mm -hmm. or to specialize and all that. And, and I always think that's, that's not a good way to do it. And, and uh, I've, I've worked, I did a, a Hamlet with an amazing actor in Moscow um, who was uh, you know, one of the top Stanislavski. Uh, he's been trained at the Stanislavski mm -hmm. Institute and all of that. And, but this guy plays piano like a god, dances, does everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you, you can see that there's this old maybe it's the communist years or something, but there's this whole way of approaching training where you have to know how to do everything, understand the connection between dance, classical ballet, uh, theater, opera, you, you have to know about everything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not just specialize in one, just acting mm -hmm. or, or acting in one style mm -hmm. or in one school of acting yeah. and all that. You have to, and, and the, the reason why, I, I, I think it's because um, I, I, I see my work a bit like, not as a, you know, people say, oh, your work is a planet, and it's, it's not a planet, it's a cosmos, in the sense that, <laughs> not, not in this pretentious way, it's in a cosmos in the sense that there's all these odd mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. and, you know, and they don't seem related or part of the same galaxy or whatever, but they're all kind of revolving and the, the, what you're, let's say I'm working on a, a circus show with Cirque du Soleil, so I'm doing this thing, and then there's a knot, there's something that's not, you know, okay, whatever. I'm moving on to this other thing, I'm doing an opera in New York City, and then there's a knot, okay? And, but then there's a solution that actually would solve this thing, and, and then there's something in the circus that's actually solving the thing I'm trying to write mm -hmm. in this new one-man show I'm doing. And you realize that all these projects, even though they're radically different, and they're in different disciplines and all that, they all inform each other, mm -hmm. and they all speak to each other. And, and it's that, that's what I, and, and I remember when the National Theatre School uh, decided to have a, a directing program, you know, and mm -hmm. they, they got all the directors in Quebec in the same room and said, how do we teach directing? And I said, well, you can't, <laughs> you can't, you don't learn that in a school necessarily unless the person learns how to write, how to act, how to design, how to, you know, if that's, but if it's just being an assistant to uh, an invited director, I'm not sure that's the, the mm -hmm. best way. I think you really have to get your hands in everything and understand how these things uh, inform each other. Mm -hmm. This brings me to um, one of the exercises that the, has been going on in, the, in uh, the university is trying to establish what are the new strategic directions that they want to go uh, towards, and and so it touches everything from business to engineering to fine arts. Um, and I'm just going to read you some of the strategic directions, and I'd like to just respond to some of them. Double our research to pursue bold goals in research that reflect our talents and our ambition to tackle big challenges. Teach for tomorrow, deliver a next generation education that's connected, transformative, and fit for the times. Get your hands dirty. Use rich experience outside the classroom to deepen learning and affect change. Mix it up. Build agile structures that facilitate intellectual mixing and internal collaboration. There's uh, five, four more, I think, or five more. Experiment boldly. Be inventive and enterprising in creating tomorrow's university. Grow smartly. Add capacity where our strengths and emerging enrollment demand intersect. 
and embrace the city, embrace the world, achieve public impact in research and learning, go beyond, push past the status quo, and go the extra mile for members of our community, take pride, celebrate successes, and be purposeful about building a legacy. So that's some of the strategic directions that we're working on. <laughs> Would you it's like quite to it's very ambitious. Yeah, it is. <laughs> very ambitious program. Thank you for uh, sharing my feeling. <laughs> no, but, uh, but, I, but, I, mm -hmm. but it's exciting. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it, there's, there's, there's um, well, what's, I, may, I may be too critical about these things, but I have the impression that we're, we're like a, a, lot of, a lot of, the word tomorrow uh, is there a lot, which is, I mean, fine, it's important, you know, but, but there's, there's, no, there's no tomorrow if there's not a past. You know, there has to be this. And, and um, this, this idea that, uh, maybe it's an idea that's more from the Orient, but um, you know, the way we, we see a tree mm -hmm. is that you see a line of horizon and you see a stick and then you have the branches, right? So that's a tree, that's the way we perceive a tree. But in, in, in the, the, um, the Eastern world, like, like in Japanese or in Chinese, the way the word tree is written is that it's the, the line of horizon and you have the, the trunk of the tree, but you also have the roots. I mean, you, it's as important mm -hmm. where things come from and where they're heading for. And this, this whole, the art of bonsai, you know, how if you want to, if, if you want to keep a tree small, you, you cut its roots and you, you work on the roots and, and it keeps it. So, so, but if you want the tree to be really high, you have to really, really work on the roots. So, so there's this, balance of, of what was done before you, what you know about the past, mm -hmm. and the avant-garde or being ahead of the curve. And, and, and that's always disconnected in, in our mm -hmm. way of teaching things, of, of structuring things. Um, you know, people want to do new things and they want to go, uh, you say, yeah, but you're not attached or anchored to anything and you don't know shits about the, Yes. You know what, what's behind you, what's been attempted, where yes. you. So, so I'm not saying that we should uh, bore people with the past only, mm -hmm. but it's to find that that uh, that balance. Mm -hmm. You know, and so so every time I, I try to move forward, I always try. To, so I like the Japanese culture and theater so much because you really feel that things are growing like this. Mm -hmm. They're not just. And at the same time, I mean, you, you've been talking about um, being able to understand, looking back at tr tradition, to be able to sort mm -hmm. of understand how it actually is part of the, the sap that still is growing in the tree, if I can use mm -hmm. that metaphor to keep it going. Um, and we can talk about Japanese culture just very briefly, but there's also sometimes in the, in the tradition a lot of codes and a lot of expectations mm -hmm. that things are done in a certain way. And mm -hmm. we talked about how that's something you broke out of pretty early on in your career. Mm -hmm. um, how would you sort of see with, you know, we're looking at bringing um, people who are, into, who are coming from um, certain traditions or anyway training in uh, music and theater and dance, but interested in collaborating and mm -hmm. um, co-inspirational work. And, but of course, then it just can spill out to the mm -hmm. image world. Um, we're talking about time-based um, creation. Mm -hmm. um, is that utopic? Uh, is that utopic? No, and utopic I think it's about re redefining exactly what, I mean, because you know, if, if you want to have different disciplines collaborate together, that sounds like a multimedia mm -hmm. or pluridisciplinaire experience because we're going to have some people from that discipline. Mm -hmm. But if you redefine, if, if, you, if, you, if you know what the definition of theater is, it's already supposed to be like that, but that's not how it's thought through. It's not, people don't think of theater as a kind of a, a point or a convergence point of all these disciplines. I mean, and that's why when you go to the theater, a lot of people are bored because it's only um, a, a piece of literature that's been yeah. put on stage, and that's what it is. It's literature first, because theater is literature. We do this, and, you know, that's how it's being perceived. But theater is also architecture. That's theater right. is also dance. Mm -hmm. It's also music. It's also gazillions of disciplines and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a meeting point. And if you know how to, if you invite the right people and the right disciplines and all that, 
so that's why this, this whole idea of, of trying to get people to collaborate, mm -hmm. it always sounds like a new idea and an avant-garde thing to have these people, but actually it's, that's what it's supposed to be already. Mm -hmm. But people don't perceive it that way. They don't think that that's the function of theater or opera. Or, mm -hmm. or, uh, I mean, it's interesting you're just because it was one of the questions, how would you define theater? Um, I could I could almost say the same thing that I could say, well, that's dance as well. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, because course. we're we're working with time and space mm -hmm. and and human effort. Um, I mean, they're like the th the equivalent of the three primary colors in visual arts. Um, but when when you um, created uh, Ex Machina, you didn't want the word theater to be a No, because we, we, didn't, we didn't want to be associated to a certain idea that people... We knew we were doing theater, right. mainly doing theater, but mm -hmm. we didn't want it to be associated only to that. That's why we called it... We, we, we left the word uh, theater and deus out. But uh, um, because... And also because it, it was founded... Uh, Ex Machina was founded in the days where we were uh, being offered a lot of resources and the new mm -hmm. high-tech thing and all that, and, and the whole idea of Ex Machina is to, to, to produce miracles out of the machine. That's what an, an Ex Machina is, and mm -hmm. the God comes out of the machine and saves the day. So the idea was to kind of see out of those machines, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're old machines or new machines, uh, there are miracles mm -hmm. that come out, and you just don't know exactly how that worked, but it, you know, if, if, if you're connected and if you know how to use these things and explore, there, there'll be... Uh, mm -hmm some kind of miracle that... that uh, I think one of the key things that I'm hearing, and, and it's something that I some often say to my students, look, if you don't remember anything that I've ever taught you, mm -hmm. you know, at least remember to surround yourself well with, with the right people to mm -hmm. work with and to live with. I mean, there, I think there is something about the human interaction that I think is uh, yeah. a huge yeah, Actually, I mean, every time I, I give a conference in a school that specializes in theater, whether it's a national school or, or a, a theater department, uh, there's always the first question when we open the question to the room, so always, what, what would you, um, what would be your counsel to a, a young uh, aspiring director and all mm -hmm. that? And, and I would say, well, forget everything you've learned in school. That's the first thing. <laughs> forget okay, everything. Okay, I'm out. No, 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 because you need to be taught, you yes. need teachers, you need all of that, you need to, need to do your homeworks, so you need to do all of that. But after that, thank you, good, bye. And, and you have to kill the father. That's right. right? Otherwise you cannot, no, no, it's true. It's and, true. and it's something. I've been, I've been murdered quite a few times. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and it's the same thing about, you know, even if I, I'd give a class here or whatever, I'd give a workshop, uh, well, fine if people are um, excited or illuminated or, or ex whatever, you know, inspired, but, but after that, forget that. Just do your thing. I mean, books, you take the book, you eat it, you digest it. And you poop it out. And you poop it out. And, and then you do your thing. You're a filter. You're not a... All these things have to go through you, not... You don't... Yes. They don't in you, they go through you. Sorry, that's right. I well, that, that's have problems with my... Is it okay? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Uh, so, so, anyways, that's what I, 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 I'm. I was saying, you know, it, and it's you know, Picasso said you have to kill the father, and, right. and it's true. You have to kill the father. And I remember um, having all these ambitions and ideas and stuff that I would stifle all the time because they didn't fit. Because I had this professor at the conservatory who really, you know, gave birth to me. I mean, he really brought me into the world of theater. He's really somebody who taught me everything. And he was like this father figure you know, and for about eight years. I remember the best work I'd do was stuff I knew he wouldn't see, you know? And then I, and I do it because I know him. And I was always waiting for his approval, always waiting for him. And it doesn't change his, you know, the greatness of this guy and the wisdom of this guy and all that. But there's a moment where I had to go, you're dead. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't, you mm -hmm. know? And, and then he comes and says, well, I'm done with this thing. I said, oh, fuck you. <laughs> you know? You, you, and we're, we're, in the next, we're in the next thing. And, and, and mm -hmm. I'll fall flat on my face and whatever. But it, mm -hmm. it, that, that, you, have to do, you have to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same with... I, I, think, I think it's the same thing with people who, who are involved with uh, tr teaching a lot of young people, is um, just get out there and do, it, do your mm -hmm. own work. You know, get on with your own life. Yeah, and um, find your audience. It's not necessarily here. Right, absolutely. Right? 
So this is somewhere. But okay, so that brings me to the, your audience. I know you're not here, but we're, we're going to keep talking amongst ourselves. Um, so you say something about uh, ex, ex machina, it uh, to become a laboratory, an incubator for a form of theater to reach and touch audiences from this millennium. Would you like to describe what this audience is, the audience of this yeah. millennium? Okay, so, so I have the impression that um, uh, we're interested in story, just basically whether you do film, video, or theater, or whatever, it's about storytelling. First, if it's not about that, then you know, do something else. It's about, about telling stories. And um, people who are in the room today or in the theater, um, 25, 30 years ago, weren't as educated um, about uh, narrative vocabulary, mm -hmm. right? They don't know they are, but they are much more savvy about storytelling than they were. They're being told stories by the web, by film, by television, by theater, by <clears throat> all sorts of uh, you know different uh, mediums. They know what a jump cut is. They know what a flashback is. They know what a uh, act zero in limbo is. Of course, they will never name it that way. They don't. They're mm -hmm. not um, educated in that sense. But they, they, they. I mean, MTV completely changed how you, mm -hmm. you know, you try to follow who's singing, what school, or whatever. You know, the the rules of storytelling have changed. Have evolved. Mm -hmm. Have become crazy. Uh, uh, so the people in the room. When they see somebody walk on stage, open the door, close the door, sit down, have a Stanislavski pause, wait for the next character to come in, they're already at the end of the scene, you know, you're not. And I feel that when I do a show and I go to the audience, is like a couple of scenes ahead of us. Because they're savvy, they know, it's like, yeah, of course the guy is going to meet the girl, and it's going to happen, right? Oh, that, well, yeah, this is going to happen, whatever. So people are very, very, very fast. Mm -hmm. So, so and that's not a bad thing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so at least if you, you can create a, a theater that tells a story and that as you're telling the story, you're at least on the same time frame, mm -hmm. you know. But very often in the theater, the audience is already at the end of the play and they're going, my God, this is going on forever. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, of course. So what do you do with that, yeah. you know? So I'm not saying that you have to do all these jump cuts and all these things and imitate. MTV or, or, or whatever, but but I'm just saying you have to be in phase with with the audience of today. The audience of today is intelligent, even though most people in our field of work think they're stupid. Uh, the people who hate the audience are the people who do what we do. I hear horrible things. The audience was trash tonight. No way, we were trash. <laughs> You, you didn't get, they're here for you. They're here to be entertained. They're here, they're there. They're on the edge of their seat. They want to understand. They want to put their imagination to the surface of what you're saying. And you're saying they're trash. Well, no, they're a different audience. It happens that they might not understand this in the same way or whatever. So, anyway, it's a very, very, very long answer to say that uh, I have the impression that you, you, you have to treat the audience as, and when I say education, I'm not talking about. Uh, They've been to university and all that. I'm just saying that they, they you know, they're being told stories by commercials, by I mean, they mm -hmm. just know how to read a story, mm -hmm. and you have to start there. And you, and the second thing is that also, there's so much offer. I mean, pe people who come to see Quills at night, you know, and I think about that often. You know, they, they have the choice, you know, to come and see your show, pay a certain amount of money, hire a babysitter. Uh, find a parking space, uh, probably get a ticket, um, <laughs> go for dinner before or after. They have to do something, a series of exceptional mm -hmm. sacrifices or whatever to come and see your show. They could stay home and see a really good movie on mm -hmm. their Apple TV in good quali high quality. They can do that now. Mm -hmm. So if they've chosen to come and see what you do, it has to be eventful. And the only way theater can survive in the 21st century is if it's an event. Mm -hmm. it's, and it takes an event 
to bring people together on stage. It takes an event to justify why this production costs the same amount of money and why the ticket is that price and why people get together. It has to be eventful. Mm -hmm. And we're in this kind of um, subsidized sub subscription kind of culture of, uh, well, we have our audience and they get, uh, for that price, you get uh, five plays with professional actors. <laughs> so, and, and we're guaranteed quality. That's not an event. Mm. That's a guarantee. That's uh, you know. So we're in this whole kind of system, and and, and uh, so easy for me to say because I don't have a subscription <laughs> season and all that. But I, I will eventually, and, and we have to reinvent the rules of that. That's right. You know, right. Uh, we're, we're building a theater in Quebec City, and we'll be having, I guess, a season. Yeah. But it's certainly not going to um, follow those those. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to just sort of, before I turn it over to the audience, because we've been talking about the audience, um, when, um, I was listening to um, Martin Fauché, who is the director of the Festival Trans Amérique, and he was talking about, and I just want to, because I want to sort of see how these things align, um, and he, he, he said our relation has changed to the image, it's very strong now, and the relation to the present moment. We're going towards uh, uh, auto fiction, documentary, live testimony, experiences of the real and the concrete. Artists have come from a tradition of dance or theater, but don't feel the need to expose their virtuosity or make it part of the work. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say also because the theater has become, um, it's become that be because uh, I guess, um, I'm gonna say a horrible thing, but film is too expensive to do and it's not accessible to everybody. So a lot of incredible, script writers uh, decide to compromise and do theater. I've seen that a lot. A lot of people want to be written and read and published and they can't. So they write a play, so they get read and they might be produced and they might be heard. So a lot of theater um, greets a lot of frustrated novel writers, filmmakers and... Dancers. Dancers and, well, you know, or, or, or TV, whatever. So, and so be it, mm -hmm. you know, if that's, the crowd of people you're, you're working with, that's fine. So a lot of people have, it's a lot of stuff you do in a, in a, in a novel or in a, you do a lot of auto fiction usually when you write, but people now are, tran are transferring that to theater. Uh, there's more and more auto fiction. Um, and and uh, a lot of uh, visual artists mm -hmm. find that they get a, a bigger crowd and more excitement and, and more of an event when they do stuff on stage mm -hmm. than they do, uh, like there's a lot of great directors now who are actually set designers who've so never been a director, never been a writer or an actor, and they, you know, they create these amazing events. Who would you go see? Who like you I say, go? it takes a sacrifice to get up and organize your life to go and see some. Whose well, work would you go and see? There's tons of people. I that you're really excited see. about? Uh, well, but the Ivo von Ova, it's just because I have to name all these mm -hmm. names, but there's all these interesting new crazy directors who, who are attempting stuff and you, you think, oh, theater's dead, and you go and see that, and no, theater's really cool. Mm -hmm. This is where it's happening. But of course, uh, you need something like Martin's Festival, the Festival des Amériques, to invite these guys and, and for people mm -hmm. to go and see that to, to know what I'm talking about. But there's some extraordinary thing out there. And sometimes it's, you know, it, it, it sucks donkey, but, but it's, it's uh, like, you know, you go see a, a Castellucci, Castellucci show and it's incredible. And right. then you go to the next one, you go, come on, guy, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's, it's, it's eventful. That's there are right. events. I think we, I, I, I'd be really interested in to see if the audience has any questions for, for Robert Lepage. I think we're at that time, aren't we, Cameron? Probably. Yeah, so let's just turn on some of the lights. Well, there are people in the room. Yeah, hi. Thank you for getting your babysitters organized. Um, is there something? Uh, there are microphones, actually, if you guys want to. Uh, ask I think you need to get up and, yeah, and maybe do to something. To be heard. So. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh. Hi. Hi there. Oh, um, I was wondering uh, about all this idea of uh, uh, to find your public and also with this idea of uh, multidisciplinary uh, because in for example you didn't want to uh, put the name theater into your uh, mm -hmm. to attach it to your uh, your company mm -hmm. um, is it comment est-ce que je dirais avec l'idée de de mettre une étiquette 
sur quelque ouais. chose. Comment est-ce que ça l'affecte le fait de choisir son public? Ouais. Si on ne veut pas étiqueter nécessairement notre, euh, euh, nos œuvres, euh, nos, euh, nos créations, euh, est-ce que ça le fait de ne pas mettre une étiquette affecte notre choix au niveau des publics? Uh, no, I don't think that uh, not, not calling yourself theater or whatever your discipline, it, it doesn't necessarily affect uh, your audience. What's important is, is the content of the work and the story that you're telling. And the thing about finding your audience, um, I, I, I was, I'm from Quebec City. I, st I still live there in Quebec City and we're doing our thing and we, we were doing our thing then and we didn't have any money, we didn't have anything or whatever. And we thought our audience was in Quebec City and hopefully it would go all the way to Montreal. <laughs> that was, but that was the ambition of absolutely everybody, and even from the people of Montreal, right? So that was the ambition of people. That's your crowd, that's your people, and that's what you do. And if you're lucky and you get subsidized, or whatever, maybe one day you'll do a diplomatic visit to France, you know? <laughs> that, that was the ambition. And I did my stuff, didn't really find an audience in Quebec. A few people were interested in all that, and then I played in a, a uh, there was a festival and we played off festival because there was tons of people from all over the world who came to this international festival who saw our show off and say why is it not why is this show not in mm. right because we're not part of the pro and the you know the big stars in Quebec and all that so so people were wondering well, this is more interesting than what's and we won the first prize of the inn because the people, the, 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 the judges, so, so people start to have you know, a bit more attention. And then it's people from Toronto who were interested in what we were doing. It was in French, most of it was in French, but it's people in Toronto said, you have to play our festival. And we went to Toronto and discovered there was this whole international crowd from all over the world that came and said, my God, we love what you do. And I said, well, you're going to take it? It's about Quebec and it's in French. <laughs> so of course, but it's universal. It's about this, about that. Right? And then we toured the world for five years with Dragon's Trilogy. So that's why I'm saying your audience is not necessarily the people you're trying to please. You know, your audience is somewhere, and it'll be somebody for it, whatever. And one day, I was working on a film with Denis Arcam, and uh, we were supposed to have dinner or something, uh, and he couldn't make it because he was in India. He was in Mumbai or something like that. And I went, oh, what are you doing there? He said, well, there's a... Uh, a, a festival uh, of my films in Mumbai, and I said, people in Mumbai know about you, <laughs> you know, and I said, oh, well, maybe he knows, you know, because he went to Cannes with Jesus in Montreal that year, so maybe people, he says, no, 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 he says, uh, since the very beginning, uh, there's this thing, there's this crowd in Mumbai who identify, connect to my work, and of course, you and he reveals this to, in interviews in Canada and all of that, and people don't know what he's talking about. But they, so there, there are, it's an audience for what you do. It's mm -hmm. just probably not here. <laughs> and yes. it eventually yes. becomes here because, yes. of course, people say, oh, he's been approved by France, he's been approved by London, he played London. It's probably good. <laughs> you know, so. There's actually one thing, I mean, I'm going to try to make it short, but there's, there's, um, I worked at, I don't want to name drop, but I, I've worked at uh, Igmar Berman's Theatre in uh, Stockholm. Okay, a couple of times. And uh, there was a, when he turned 80, uh, all of uh, Swedish television, all summer for his 80th birthday, would present every night uh, a film by Bergman, he did a lot, or a play that had, had been uh, recorded on TV, or an interview or a documentary. So every night I had these amazing Bergman films or whatever and all that. But of course it was all in Swedish, and there were no cyber titles, so, but I could understand a bit of Swedish because I was working in Swedish with some actors there. And uh, at one point, they, they uh, showed Persona. And Persona is my favorite Bergman film. It's black and white, it's beautiful, it's amazing, and all that. But there were no surtitles. And I went, oh, this is what's so odd about it. There's no surtitles. And surtitles are part of the aesthetic of, of Bergman for us, you know, because you, know, you never translate or dub a, a, a Bergman film. You put surtitles. So I said that to Anita Bjork, who's a great uh, Bergman actress I was working with at the time, and I said, my God, it's so weird for us to see a Bergman in Swedish, because it's no, it's so, and she said, yeah, and that saved his ass, these, 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 um, the surtitles saved his ass, and I said, what are you talking about? And supposedly, up until The Seventh Seal, Bergman was not considered a good uh, film director in Sweden, because his Swedish was very bad, because he did not, you, you know, he, like my French is not that good when I speak French and whatever. So, so people were always kind of, there was that screen of bad Swedish that would keep people from seeing the content and connecting to the films he did. 
And he wasn't even present in Cannes when Seven Seal was presented there, when he won the, the, the Palme d'Or. So what's the job of a good surtitle? It's the job of a good writing. You know, it has to be concise, it has to be you know, mm -hmm. to the point. So, so when we did Dragon's Trilogy in uh, Frankfurt the first time, the surtitles were amazing. <laughs> you know? People did not hear how badly written it was. <laughs> and I'm not joking, it was badly written. Bad dialogue, bad French. So what? It's what's behind that layer that moved mm -hmm. people and made it universal. So that's why I'm saying whatever the reason why people don't connect with your work in your locality, uh, it doesn't mean that your, your work is bad. Mm. It just means it's clumsy. There's probably an, as an aspect of it that's very clumsy, that's uh, you know, keeping people from connecting what it is that you're trying to, to say or express. Before we take another question, I, I, there was just one little thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, you're going to be, you've been chosen as one of the mentors for the Rolex mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a philanthropic program, and I think the protégés have been chosen. Yeah. I, let me just guess, okay, because I did, I did my research, and I'm just wondering who you chose. Did you choose the guy from India? I can't say anything. Okay. I'm not allowed to say anything. Okay. Rolex is going to take my watch away. <laughs> Um, anyway, so th th it's just a, it's a very interesting uh, program where they, they team up <laughs> How come mentors. you know there was an Indian guy as a... As a I don't know, I just read, uh, I went and did my research, but I thought you had kind of affinities. Anyway, let's take a question. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I'm wondering if you could address a bit a more of a mundane uh, issue, perhaps, which is self-discipline. I'm just wondering, I mean, it was fascinating when you were talking about, you know, dialogue in the room and roots under the table and, mm -hmm. you know, very uh, evocative, but I'm wondering yourself, is it something that on a day-to-day -day basis, like where the role of discipline fits mm -hmm. in your process? Well, well, I'm not a very disciplined person when somebody imposes its rules. And if I work for another theater, another company, I'm, I'm not very disciplined because I don't understand or the, the rules don't uh, apply to me or fit. Me. I don't feel comfortable with that. But I invented my own rules. So if you invent your own system and uh, you, you, then you're comfortable and it's easy to be disciplined. Uh, we've devised this whole way of working at the Kazam <clears throat> because the production um, of ex uh, production people of Ex Machina have invented this whole extraordinary structure around the work so that it actually, um, if you're going to do uh, production in the shape of a pear, well then the production has the shape of a pear. And then after that you're going to do a cake, well then it's the shape of a, of a a cake, you know, so, so they, they, don't, they don't have a cookie cutter way of approaching, uh, so, so that, that's one thing. And one, one of the things, the systems that, that we do is that we only work in the mornings and in the evenings as Why? much as we can, not always, but we, because creative energy is good in the morning and, the after, and in the evenings. In the afternoon, you're digesting your lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and I've always felt uncomfortable anyways, it's always, uh, uh, but mornings and evenings are incredible. And, and, and so, so we've kind of, because we're free, so we impose that. So well, that's, that's how we work. Of course, in Montreal, that's very frustrating because there's a lot of good shows and stuff and, you know, going on in Quebec City. It's not as frustrating. It was so, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you can do that because uh, people live in hotels very close to where we work. And, and so they have the afternoon to, to doze off or to do their laundry or whatever, do their banking and, and or do research. So what happens is in the morning, Technicians, uh, at, at the end of, of the morning, they see where we're, we have an idea, we're developing this idea, we want to try this thing. So in the afternoon, there will be a set of carpenters of people that come in and who will build a prototype or prepare something so that in the evening, the ideas that have been thought of in the morning or that have surged, uh, appeared in the morning will be verified in the evening. And very often it works, you know, you go, okay. So, so, so it's, it's a kind of a way of devising work where the production people are involved and it's a whole system of, you know, day, afternoon, night, and energy, creative energies mm -hmm. that with time became a system that we kind of impose to people who work with us. They're always very frustrated at first, you know, but then eventually they go, oh, this is so organic, so natural, and then we manage to do a lot of work in very, very little time. This reminds me of Steve Paxton, who is a, an amazing, who started contact improvisation and dance. And as he's getting a little older, 
uh, when he proposes workshops now, he says, I'll work for uh, five hours and then s everyone sleeps. Mm -hmm. So you can digest and let it kind of go into your body, all the whole experience that you've done, and then you can meet again a little later and do a little bit more work. So, you know, trying to fit that into a schedule at the university is kind of a challenge, although I totally, <coughs> I think that's exactly, he knows exactly how the work needs to be done. And yeah. so that kind of self-discipline is also structuring. I tried to do that, I, I, when I was working with Peter Gabriel on some shows, and, and uh, I tried to impose that. You know, and uh, With people, whom? people, Peter Gabriel. Oh yes. And uh, you know, in the in the rock and roll world, people didn't even show up in the morning. You know? <laughs> and eventually, you know, people show up really late and go, okay, well at least we'll do the, the evening session, but they don't stop. Mm -hmm. It just goes on forever, and you go, whoa, 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 whoa guys, we need to be in here tomorrow. And it's just so you have to eventually to adapt your system to mm -hmm. the system of rock and roll. So you have to be respectful of other people's ways of doing it, but. Uh, it certainly not as my way of doing it. No. Do we have another question in the house? Yeah, I, I'm curious. I'm a musician. And you've talked about music in the context of opera and other things. Uh -huh. I'm curious if I take away all your toys. There's no theater. There's no dancing. There's no words. I'd love to hear you just talk about the story that the music tells. What kinds of stories do you hear? Just with the music? Yeah. You okay. say everything has to tell a story. Uh, so. Oh my God! Well, it's it's a very large question. It's just because. <laughs> it's a very uh, large question, but well, I'll tell you what's missing. Playing though. the sound. Yeah. Well, it's just because um, mu music is you know the uh, theater is um, the meeting point. And opera, certainly opera, is the meeting point of time and space, right? So it's, this is time, this is space, yeah. And um, and you can't tell a story if you don't have both. I, I think and the things that music is more related to time. Mm -hmm. So so you know, certainly because of the rhythm and all that, but, but it, it, it's this kind of abstract notion, like time is, you know, you can't really, it goes from one point and it goes only in one direction. Music never goes backwards. Even if you play it backwards, it's still going forward, right? So it's this thing, it's, it's this the timeline thing. So I'm somebody who's obsessed with space. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's always very important to find where the connection points are between the idea of space and mm -hmm. time, and time being the music or the sound aspect, and, and uh, space being the more kind of concrete architectural spacing, blocking, mm -hmm. moving movement thing. So that's why I, I get along very well with uh, um, conductors in the opera, because I don't barge in into their time thing, and they don't barge into my space. We try to have these two things. They're responsible of, of time, I'm responsible of space. Can we take uh, one or a couple more questions? I know Robert Lepage has to leave soon to go to do another set of interviews and prepare for performing. Hi. Um, I was curious, this, um, this idea of having the rehearsal process take two years and that there's this space and time to have this, the unconscious kind of do its work. And I was wondering if you have other methods that you use to, um, to bring that out, or if that comes into play more often in your creative process. Uh, you mean other ways than, than what I described in, in the kind of eight weeks? Uh... Yeah, like even in the conversations, that you're having the creative conversations around the table, like how else does that? Well, I mean, I'd say the, the basic thing is that whatever we do, uh, we, have to, we have to play, right? In the sense of the, in the playfulness of the term. Um, unfortunately, theater, there's too many actors in the theater, not enough players. And we've forgotten that that's what theater is about. It's about playing, right? Mm -hmm. And a play is called a play for a reason. Right, and uh, but unfortunately, there's a lot of actors and like, it's, it's acting, and, but very few players, and, and uh, it's important that from the get-go that anybody, any actor that comes into the room, uh, is not going to be doing acting; they're going to be playing. So that means you have to literally invent games, right? So, so what we do is much more playful than than. Uh, so it's difficult to explain, but that's what we did. It doesn't mean it only. It doesn't just only go through improv. It's a. It goes through exploration. It could take any shape and form, and we just explore, and we prototype, and we play. We play with things. We play. Uh, 
so, so the playfulness eventually becomes infectious, you know. And 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 if if you if you're a good player, you will you will infect your <laughs> your audience. You you will mm-hmm. uh, bring this idea that this idea of, of playfulness. So the audience usually goes for something that's playful, and and I always compare it to sports, you know. And I, I, it's performance. Performance is it's a you know it's, you don't drop the ball and you you try to. It's quite a sport, and 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 uh, if you've been playful in the development of your piece, that will that will show, and people will be much more like they are in a in a stadium when they go to see a hockey game or whatever. That it's actually, you know, there's some, some, something being played off. That's like that flow concept too, right? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the flow concept that you brought yes. up earlier. Um, Who's a name I can't pronounce very well? Yeah, Chicksman. Yeah. <laughs> Chicks <men. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone explained it to me once. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one last question? Je vais poser ma question en français pour être plus clair. En fait, là, vous avez commencé à parler de cette chose-là, ce lien entre le processus et le résultat. Oui. J'arrive comme à un moment dans ma vie où je suis obsédée par cette rencontre qui ne peut se faire. J'ai l'impression que le processus est tellement important que le résultat est juste une chose. Oui, mais ça dépend. It depends when the red. Actually, the question is about uh, uh, process and results and, and how these things uh, interact. Well, it depends what you call results and when that thing happens. For me, the process is forever. Um, maybe I'll give you an example is that what we call a play often is something that's published, right? I read a play. And often there's plays that have been published before they've been performed, right? Which is kind of odd. For me, a play, you can publish it once it's been performed and toured and rewritten a thousand times while you're performing it. So the results uh, on the night of the opening should never be a guillotine. But unfortunately, that's what it usually is in, in the commercial, professional subscription world. Um, it's the night of the opening, and from now on, This is what the show is. You have to find ways for that to be a starting point and not an end point. So that's why what we call results um, is, is something that's along the way. It's never this is what the show is. And, and, and that, that idea that um, we're not presenting something that's canned, like a, a TV show or, or a film. It's something that's actually moving and always um, reflecting who you are the day you are performing it. And that's always my disappointment with, with film. I've done a few films and uh, they invite you to a festival in Sydney, Australia, to see uh, a film you did two years ago. And you go, that's not who I am now. Mm-hmm. It's like the ghost of my old me or something. You know? <laughs> But theater, even if I've been touring for 10 years with the same show, it's always who I am, the moment where I'm performing it. So that's the great thing about, about and, and, and um, I, um, I think, and that's why en I invite fait, people. C'est ça, mais cette contradiction mm. du comment l'industrie est faite. Oui, but, but don't follow the industry, <laughs> follow yourself. So I, I allow myself and what I do to do public rehearsals, and they're as exciting as an opening night in Montreal. More exciting than an opening night in Montreal. But, but uh, uh, you know, after three weeks of rehearsal, we do a show in front of a a room of people that we invited, and, and uh, we have a party afterwards, and people come up and say, oh, I didn't understand this, or what is this thing you're doing, or whatever. But it's great, it's, it's part of this. So, so the idea of what's the results, what is a result and what's not, it becomes very, very, uh, very vague and, and very unimportant mm-hmm. at the end, I think. You said the end. We're going to take it from that point. Um, I'd like to thank Robert Lepage enormously. Thank you.